back um, to the after lunch hour. We're starting a little bit late and still missing a couple members, but I'm sure they are on their way. Uh, we're currently discussing water and sewer districts. Um, Representative Sweeney, did you have more to add before I call up the county clerks? Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So uh, I think um, in addition, I think there's a little more testimony out there. Um, I know the uh, uh, Bar Nun and uh, Mills uh, town attorneys, um, they actually use the same attorney, uh, may have some input on today's testimony if it suits. suits. All right, uh, before we get to them, um... I'm gonna let the county clerks go behind you if the county clerks had any comments on water sewer districts at this time, not at this time? Just special districts in general? Okay. Just so everyone knows I'm slightly stalling until I get my computer on to let people into the room. No one else here showed up. County commissioners, anything to add on water sewer districts, Mr. Riemann? Um, well, let me check on the room real fast and bring in, I uh, know Mr. Ford, um, Mayor Ford, if you have more comments, you're certainly welcome to jump back in the meeting at this point. You don't quite look like Mayor Ford, but I'm guessing you're the town attorney. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, as you can tell, everybody on uh, this side of this is named Patrick one way or another. So I'm not Patrick Ford. I'm Patrick Holscher. Uh, and as uh, Mr. Sweeney noted, I'm the uh, attorney for the town of Bar Nun, uh, as well as the city of Mills. So I'll be uh, presenting testimony in that uh, capacity. Again, thank you for the committee uh, hearing us today. Um, I think uh, just listening to the testimony that was presented this morning, uh, what should be clear to everyone is that uh, this committee and the legislature in general is dealing with what essentially is an inconsistent or an incomplete uh, statutory legacy. Uh, and it's an understandable one. Uh, before any of these statutes uh, that we've been dealing with here today existed, uh, we had municipal water systems, and uh, for people who lived outside of municipalities, uh, they had you know very little in the way of a formal option. I mean, there there were some uh, private water systems, and there still are a few, but the legislature came in and created uh, this system water and sewer districts so that it could uh, provide a way to provide those services to individuals who lived in uh, areas that are were in counties but in, outside of incorporated municipal areas. And in fact, when you read the statutes involved that are uh, at uh, section 4110 and follows, uh, they specifically uh, refer to water and sewer districts in that context. Uh, water and sewer districts are, are limited uh, in formation to unincorporated areas of municipalities. Um, municipalities may annex into their boundaries uh, but only in ways that are uh, specifically set out uh, by uh, the statutes at 4110, uh, 150, and the sections that follow. And when you look at those provisions, what is clear is that when the legislature came in and added those provisions, what they were worried about uh, was a municipality uh, annexing into an area and uh, taking over a district's debt. Um, the uh, testimony from uh, Mayor Ford earlier today shows why they would have been concerned about that. It would have been a tough burden uh, for a newly forming city or a newly forming town to take over that debt. In fact, actually, 
um, the statute or the, excuse me, the Wyoming Supreme Court opinion that shows up um, in the sections that were referred to earlier today provides an interesting example of just that. Um, Mr. McGuire referred to it earlier, uh, found and being the uh, case of Miller versus Town of Mills, that 1979 uh, case specifically dealt with uh, the Town of Mills annexing an area and then noting by way of letter that it was not taking over the water and sewer district that existed in that area. And when you read it, the reason it wasn't taking it over was that it was burdened by debt. Uh, later, residents of that area challenged that annexation and the Supreme Court noted that it had been properly done because of that letter. But to complete the story, that uh, debt was ultimately satisfied and that region of the town of Mills today uh, is serviced uh, through the Mills system. That actually is not the Wardwell system that's uh, been referred to earlier here. Uh, so the debt was satisfied, uh, the town took it over, and that's exactly what the statutes seem to contemplate. And in fact, if you read uh, the discussion at Wyoming Statute 4110-155, uh, it actually discusses how water and sewer districts are to keep on providing services in an area inside of a town when the town annexes into them, the town doesn't take it over until such time uh, as uh, the obligations of the water and sewer district are satisfied and the system turned over uh, to the municipality. So the question really here that you're dealing with is what, what happens when uh, that doesn't happen and it doesn't happen not because the municipality isn't ready to take it over. It doesn't happen because the debt uh, has not been satisfied. Um, it doesn't happen simply because the district for its own reasons uh, doesn't uh, want it to occur. Um, this, is, this is an anomaly. Normally the district, normally this doesn't come up because the districts cooperate in this. They feel their job is done. Uh, the town is ready to take it over and it is turned over. But as uh, the testimony presented here this morning has shown uh, on occasion, that doesn't occur. And this is an example that we have going on where it is not. And we know what the result is. Uh, the water customers of Bar None and Mills pay an additional eight mills uh, in property tax. Uh, the, unnecessarily. Um, they wouldn't be paying that additional eight mills if uh, these areas were serviced just by their towns. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion about um, elections and you've heard that the elections in this particular water and sewer district are irregular, but, but adding to that, it's already the case that uh, municipal voters are voting for town councils, they're voting for county commissioners, in addition uh, to voting for state offices. And if you live in uh, Bar None or this section of Mills, there's an additional, um, probably somewhat mysterious uh, election for uh, people to attempt to track. For all of us who work in this sort of thing every day, or for those of you directly involved, that uh, probably almost seems second nature, but for busy uh, homeowners and uh, families that are just trying to get to by with their daily lives on a day-to-day -day basis, one more election uh, of a small district for something that just seems to be providing provided by their town uh, is, is kind of an oddity. Uh, there's an additional layer of bureaucracy for everybody to be involved with. Everything from simply paying your water bill uh, to another entity to um, the arranging for the services to put in water service if you're a developer uh, or a builder to just getting your water line serviced uh, if something goes wrong. Um, Senator Case noted earlier that this was an opportunity uh, to reduce a layer of government. And this is not only an opportunity to reduce a layer of government, but 
an opportunity to provide a means of doing so that really matters to real people on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, a lot of us are a lot more uh, inclined to probably want to call down to the city uh, to deal with a water line that has something gone wrong than they are with a lot of other governmental body, bodies that exist uh, and impact our daily lives, but not in such a direct um, fashion. So the overarching goal of all this is uh, uniformly the same. What we're trying to do, what everybody's trying to do, uh, we're trying to do, the districts are trying to do, and the legislature is trying to assure is that uh, a singular goal of providing water to municipal and industrial customers uh, effectively, safely, and cost efficiently is achieved. Um, what we're asking you to do, uh, whether you do it uh, through the existing House Bill 72 or through another bill that might be crafted, is um, to take into consideration what will undoubtedly be a more and more common um, occurrence in the state of Wyoming as cities and towns grow into uh, water and sewer districts. And that is the situation where they grow into the district. Uh, ultimately, the district uh, doesn't really need to continue to exist, um, at least insofar as the town municipal boundaries are concerned and town residents shouldn't have to be paying an extra of uh, eight mils of tax, um, shouldn't have to be dealing with additional uh, bureaucratic layers and multiple government entities, uh, simply to be able to accomplish one of the most basic of things, which is to turn on their tap and get water. Uh, so uh, that would conclude uh, my testimony on this. All right, questions for Mr. Holscher? Representative McGuire. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Holscher, I appreciate your testimony. And my question is, with regard to the uh, statutes, have you asked for an attorney general opinion? And if not an attorney general opinion, have you looked to the district court, local district court? Or have you asked the county commissioners to request a uh, an opinion, and the reason that I ask is before we go down the road of trying to, every time you change a statute, it affects 20 other things. And having read through the statute, I just don't see where there, uh, I'm not seeing where there is a lack of clarity and why the current statutes couldn't be enforced and take care of this issue. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Representative sure. McGuire, uh, thank you, Commissioner and Representative McGuire, for um, that question. In fact, actually, um, not only is the answer to all of those uh, questions uh, yes, um, it is the source of some frustration on this level, which uh, explains why we're in front of you today. Um, to kind of go back to the origin of that, when we first went through this set of statutes um, at seeking to resolve this issue on behalf of the residents of these this municipalities, uh, this set of municipalities, it, it seemed relatively straightforward to us. I mean, not, not perfectly so, to be honest, but I mean, it seemed like there was a, a pathway forward. And in fact, actually, we were aided in that uh, by a prior um, opinion that we located, um, the origin of which seems to be um, slightly obscure, but which, which was either earlier an earlier attorney general's opinion or an, uh, in a letter written by the LSO uh, for the legislature. So when uh, that was looked into, uh, we uh, started down the path that um, seem to be the one that would resolve this, which is, is a little bit unnecessarily complicated, frankly, but which involved uh, submitting a petition, having the residents submit a petition uh, to the Natrona County Commissioners, uh, which would have sought a, uh, a ballot uh, submission on it, i.e. the residents 
or the customers of the Wardwell Water and Sewer District would have an opportunity um, to vote on whether they wish to continue the district or not. Uh, that petition became what what we might call, I guess, a little bit marooned um, uh, down at uh, the county commission and the conflict, I guess, in views you heard expressed today came up. Uh, the representative of the Bighorn uh, Water and Sewer Districts you heard earlier today expressed the opinion, well, they, can't they just send this down to their county commission for a vote? It's not quite that easy. You actually have to get the county commissioners to agree to submit it to a vote. Whereas um, the representative of the Natrona County Commission said it is their view that it that is impossible. And in fact, actually, what we learned after having uh, facilitated the submission of the uh, pet residents petition to the Natrona County Commissioners is that um, it came to be the view of the Natrona County Commissioners that not only uh, is that process not the one that works, but uh, that it is impossible to uh, dissolve a water and sewer district. Uh, they essentially took the view that it's just like a municipality and that cannot be done. Um, at that point, uh, what you next noted um, occurred is we, that is the um, uh, town of Bar Nun and uh, the city of Mills requested an attorney general's uh, opinion on this matter. Uh, we received a plot reply from the attorney general uh, that they do not and cannot give opinions to uh, municipalities, but only counties can receive attorney general's opinions. Um, this next came up uh, through the action of Mayor Ford, who was at the Natrona County Commission uh, meeting when this topic was brought up, and uh, the topic of an AG's opinion uh, was discussed, and the Natrona County Commission said they would ask for an Attorney General's opinion. Um, we've been in contact with the, with the Natrona County Attorney several times um, since that event, which is approximately uh, six weeks ago or so, and were assured on a couple of instances that the letter would go out that week. Um, but uh, as far as we know, it is not, which, you know, we may, it may have gone out, and we just simply do not yet know of it. But at, as recently as last week, um, which was, you know, some six weeks after that event, the letter had still not uh, gone out. Uh, so uh, while I would um, agree with you that it seems like we ought to be able to read the statutes, it must be the case that there's a solution in here and we could proceed forward. Um, we have found that everybody that uh, we've sent it to so far um, has had a different opinion. Um, the one thing we have not done, which you did reference, was to file a declaratory judgment action um, seeking to have a court resolution. Uh, that topic, without getting too far into it, uh, has been kicked around a little bit uh, be because of the there's nothing we can do responses that we've generally received. So, Mr. Uh, Holscher, uh, can I interrupt you real fast? You sure can. I'm going on and on. The overall question, do you feel you've done your due diligence in trying to find a resolution through legal means up to this point? Yes or no? Yes, we do. Okay. Thank you. Further questions, Reverend McGuire? Okay. Any other further questions for the city attorney of Mills and Bar None? Seeing none. Thank you very much, Mr. Holscher. Uh, other people wish to testify? Wham? You're good in the back, Mr. McLaurin, kind of clerks. Not seeing anyone else. And not seeing anyone else online. All right. We will close public comment committee. What are your thoughts that you would like to pursue? Representative McGuire. Sorry, I was looking to my right, Senator Scott. Go ahead, Joe. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I will defer to the good senator. But thanks to uh, LSO attorney Ted Hewitt, he pulled up uh, statute 91603, subparagraph A. Romanet 6, 
which uh, describes that when requested, given written opinions upon questions submitted to him by election, by elective and appointed state officers, and by either branch of the legislature, when in session, the attorney general may offer an opinion. So I would just uh, put that out there and then I would defer to the good Senator whose uh, district this actually lies in. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, Senator Scott. Recommend to the committee. Um, first, I think we ought to ask our LSO staff to examine the statutes regarding what happens to when a uh, city grows into a uh, water and sewer district and does not immediately take it over and trying to trying to figure out what whether things really are unclear or not uh, I would suggest the committee invite the attorney general to come to this committee as to and, and talk to us as to about what the attorney general thinks the laws are and does the attorney general think any legislation is needed uh, by him come to the next meeting. Um, and then uh, I think we ought to ask the LSO uh, maybe after that meeting, but maybe ahead uh, to, to draft a bill to, to have a clear so there is a clear path forward as to, to how it should happen if, if there is a discovery of ambiguity in the law. Uh, and then on the election issues, uh, I'd like a report from, from the DLSO staff at the next committee meeting. Uh, what are the re summary requirements for uh, a water and sewer district in terms of electing their board and what are the means of enforcing that that actually happens? Uh, and it sounds to me, Mr. Chairman, like there's a problem. I'd like to have a bill draft uh, prepared that for those with more than, and I'd put a thousand taps in to start with simply because that's an easy number to adjust up and down. That if they're over that, uh, then they need to be have their board elected if they're political subdivisions they are at the they have the general election through the normal processes that we do use in some of the other districts to get on the ballot then uh, and I think what I think Mr. Chairman is that we've got a procedure that works fine for a small district that basically where their neighbors they know each other it's small community that this district is simply outgrown. Uh, and uh, maybe if there was a more regular election, they'd pay a little more attention to, to customer service, which seems to be a major problem. And putting a thousand taps in as a, as a uh, trigger point, I don't know whether that's right or wrong, but it gives us a number we can amend up and down easily. So that'd be my suggestion to the committee. All right, I believe that was five suggestions. Let me um, do what I can as a chairman to uh, negotiate those out. So LSO, uh, I don't think I need a committee directive. We can invite the attorney general herself or her deputy who would oversee this area to come to our next meeting. Consider that a request. And if she says no, have her call me. Um, then LSO, we can also ask you for a report. Uh, hopefully Danielle, on the summer requirements for water and sewer districts, enforcement mechanisms, what we can do there. So those would be two requests. Um, and I guess the third request is we can ask you to examine our statutes uh, for your opinion of what happens when a city overgrows a water district and at least a legislative prerogative outside of the attorney general's prerogative on if you think a statutory means is needed. I'm assuming yes, or you would have advised Representative Sweeney that he didn't need a bill draft, but we can talk about that. So those are the three directives. We're on the same page so far, LSO. <coughs> and then there is potentially two motions. So let's start with um, Senator Scott. Do you want to officially make a motion for the thousand taps to have the board elections at a general election? Or how do you want to phrase? Mr. Chairman, I would ask Uh, 
avoid it easily in that context. I think, I think we may be dealing with a relatively unique circumstance where the district from this one not is the old that sounds like a motion. Is there a second? Seconded by Senator Case. Discussion on that motion. A question, uh, Representative Bear. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a question. Would this just apply to water and sewer districts alone or any other type of special district? Mr. Chairman. Senator Scott. At this point, I think we better talk about just water and sewer districts. Compliance with all the other districts, you get some pretty unique and different right. circumstances. Water and sewer districts have a distinct impact on people. Uh, and um, as in other utilities, we've seen where the utility has to be responsive to its customers. That tends to take care of a lot of the problems we're seeing here. And I think making them go through a formal election when they get this, this big may well solve a lot of those problems. Further discussion on the motion for a bill draft? Seeing none, all in favor of having a bill drafted for our next meeting regarding generally elected water and sewer district boards with at least a thousand taps as a starting place, please say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. No. That motion is carried. Um, and then. Stuff my gun, please. Um, and then, Senator Scott, you did mention you wanted also to potentially consider a draft bill for a more clear path forward, but that may come after the attorney general. Well, a little more careful examination. What I suspicion we're gonna find is that uh, where a larger city overtakes a smaller district, everything is pretty clear and works fine. But in a circumstance such as we've had here, the district predated the city. Uh, a new city was in no position to take them over. You've got a, a, a situation that's grown and festered. And I suspect there's just a gap in the law and that's what we're gonna find. But I think maybe we ought to hear from the AG and hear from our staff as to what the current law is before we, before we go to that, try to change it. Okay, further discussion on this subject? Anyone on the committee? Senator DeCase. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll go with that, but I would, I would also go with a contingent motion that staff would go ahead and draw the bill draft if that was the determination. Seems to me you gotta have a way to undo things you do. It's just, it's gotta be a clear process. I'm not saying it's a good idea. I'm not even saying it's a good idea in this, this situation, but that you've gotta have that ability. Just as far as self-determination of the, the people and, and everything. Mr. Chairman. Senator Scott. I'd be perfectly willing to go along with that idea. Uh, and maybe the chairman or somebody the chairman designates could give LSO some guidance as to given what they find, what do we want to include in the bill draft? Um, I think that's fair as we pr proceed. Um, certainly know you can talk to Representative Sweeney or Senator Scott, but it affects their district. So. They would be probably the two best people to help navigate should you have questions or issues in this specific regard, but we don't want to make, we want to make sure we don't adversely impact other districts throughout Wyoming currently. But I do think it's interesting that the recommendation that a water sewer district holds equal footing with a, an incorporated municipality is, cannot be correct. I mean, cities have home rule for a reason and that should trump mostly everything in our laws. Uh, other discussion on Senator Boner. And just briefly, Mr. Chairman, I'd note that uh, we've been talking a lot about this uh, special district. They're not, they're not here today. Um, so hopefully if they haven't been invited, I want to make sure that they have an opportunity to be here and we can hear the other half of the story if, uh, if there is one and uh, before we get uh, too far down one path or the other. Certainly think that will be fair and appropriate. All right. Anything else, committee, on this subject? Seeing none, we'll move on to tourism improvement districts. Mr. Brown, welcome to Corporations. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Chris Brown, representing the Wyoming Lodging and Restaurant Association, the Wyoming Travel Industry Coalition. I mean, we're here today to support um, legislation enabling tourism improvement districts. 
Um, this bill, the bill that was listed on the corporation's um, committee materials is a bill that we were able to pass through the House in 2019. It got through committee in the Senate and then it failed to pass um, on the Senate floor. And so we sincerely appreciate you all considering this topic once again. As, I, as I've testified in front of you all before, tourism is a competitive business and not just in attracting traditional vacationers, a family coming to Yellowstone or, or whatever, but it's also extremely competitive in um, attracting regional sporting events, traveling rodeos, large uh, conventions, et cetera. And the, cre the creation of TIDs would allow local businesses to fund additional marketing and promotion of the assets or the events in their communities. It also would allow them to enhance product development in their communities designed to in increase visitation and grow their own local visitor economy. Um, TIDs are being utilized in 19 states with 190 tourism improvement districts currently across the country and that number is growing. Um, the key with that is that they are being utilized in South Dakota, in Montana, and in Colorado, all states that we directly compete with um, to grow our slice of the tourism pie. Mr. Chairman, rather than roll through 23 pages of legislation with your permission, I would just like to give a brief overview of the basic mechanics of a tourism improvement district because it differs some from the special districts that we've spoken about earlier today. Um, to begin with, tourism improvement district legislation would be enabling legislation. If the bill was to move forward and pass, it doesn't say that any community has to have a tourism improvement in district. Instead, it would just allow this as a tool for local businesses and communities to consider if it was a good fit for their community. Um, I wanted to, Mr. Chairman, just talk about three quick definitions um, that I'm going to use as I briefly explain TIDs. When I'm talking about a majority of businesses, I'm talking about businesses that would pay more than 50% of the proposed revenue generated by a tourism improvement district. When I refer to hospitality related businesses, as it was listed in the 2019 bill draft, I'm speaking about overnight accommodations, restaurants, attractions, or resorts. One thing I've noticed in my brief tenure with um, trying to promote sp any special district is there seems to be an immediate concern, are you gonna rope my business into your special district? I've, I was asked just this morning, a similar question we were asked in 2019, what about my hardware store on the corner? Is that gonna get roped into this? No, in the bill, we specifically outline which hospitality related businesses may participate in a tourism improvement district. And so strictly those four. And then finally, Mr. Chairman, TIDs are not funded in the same manner of the special districts that we spoke about earlier today. There is no mill levy. There's no local election. TIDs are funded by an assessment that businesses charge their customers to fund the overall business plan that needs to be put forward at the beginning of a tourism improvement district. And so, Mr. Chairman, briefly, if a majority of hospitality related businesses wish to form a TID, they would petition their local governing body. So city council, if the TID was drawn within the municipality, obviously the county commissioners, if it reached out into the county or was the entire county. A point that I failed to mention earlier, Mr. Chairman, as I was talking about hospitality related businesses, I listed out those four different businesses within our industry. The TID would not have to be all of those businesses. It could be just hotels. It could be hotels and restaurants. It could be all four of them. The flexibility in there is allowed to, to best accommodate local communities. And when I say that, I'm thinking of a small rural community. What if a small rural community had one hotel, but had three or four restaurants and those, the majority of those businesses wanted to get together and create this for uh, creating an event that was gonna grow the visitor economy in that small rural town. So again, the bill is designed for ultimate flexibility at the local level to grow the local visitor economy. Um, the petition would be signed by the majority of businesses as I defined earlier um, and proposing the district. And it would essentially include a business plan, which was an annual budget, the assessment rate, the specific activities or expenditures um, the funds would be utilized for, the name of the district and the board that is overseeing it, and a map of the boundary, including every related business 
within the proposed district. So all of that would be presented up front to the governing body for consideration. The local governing body would then adopt a, okay. <laughs> Glad, good to know, thank you. Uh, the local governing body, Mr. Chairman, would then adopt a resolution of intent to form the district and would hold a public meeting with written notice to all related business owners within the district, the proposed district. Again, Mr. Chairman, this is not a tax or a mill levy, um, but an assessment on the business's customers. Um, it, it typically is either a, per, a percentage or a flat fee. Nationally, about 67% of TIDs are funded by a percentage on receipts, so X percent on a hotel room night stay, for example. Um, and 33% are funded through a flat fee, $1 per room, something like that. Um, the budget would be overseen either by the governing body or a committee that the governing body appoints or a board designated by the governing body. Um, and the collection mechanism would be the governing body. In the bill written in 2019, there was um, an administrative, uh, several percent administrative fee that would help pay for those costs with the governing body. Um, Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> a new district would have a maximum term of five years and each consecutive term would have a maximum limit of 10 years. And it's important to note that each year there would be a 30 day window where a majority of the businesses could dissolve the district if it wasn't working out the way that they had planned. So there is an out once a year. Mr. Chairman, as our industry continues to rebound from last year's, from, from all that was 2020, we're not just looking to get back to the same levels that we were at. We're looking to grow and expand the state's second largest industry. And one of the biggest opportunities that we have to grow tourism is Wyoming is spreading folks out. Through my 10 years of lobbying on behalf of hospitality and tourism, I hear a lot about, it's all about the Northwest corner of the state. And certainly as a state, we lead with our greatest natural assets. But as we all know, there are a ton of small communities and towns that we can spread those visitors out in on their way there. And if we can get them to stop and spend an extra night in some of those communities, it's those communities that benefit from it. I wanna close Mr. Chairman in responding to a question that Senator Nethercott asked earlier today. And that was, will this really make a meaningful difference? Civitas, Mr. Chairman, is the company in the United States that is known as the national expert in tourism improvement districts. We've worked with them for the past several years. I think that they've assisted every single state that has a tourism improvement district. In a survey that they conducted, 76% of, uh, of, of the businesses in the existing districts reported an increase in new visitors from both new and existing markets when they had a TID in place. We all know that more visitors equates to more revenue in the businesses in our communities. It also equates to more sales tax revenue for local government and for state government as well. And so we see this as a good versatile op option for businesses in communities to take advantage of that's driven by business. Um, and that really has an opportunity to grow some of these smaller local, uh, local visitor economies as well. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I greatly appreciate the time and I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, Senator Scott, go ahead. Um, the North Platte River from the Gray Reef Dam to the city of Casper uh, is arguably the best trout fishing in, in the Rocky Mountain region. And we've got a growing business there. Uh, if you were to put together something to promote that and try to bring more people in, uh, the prime beneficiary and people who really should want it promoted would be the fishing guides and the fly shops. Is there flexibility in this where they could be included uh, in both the paying for and the governance? Uh, or is it just restricted to, to I'm, I'm unclear whether they could participate in that. Mr. Chairman, that's the first question I have, sorry. Mr. Brown, Mr. Chairman and Senator Scott, great question. 
As a former fly fishing guide on the North Platte, I know exactly what you're talking about. And I know exactly what you're talking about as far as the development along that corridor has been over the past 20 years. I believe it was you that brought an amendment in Senate committee in 2019 that allowed for TIDs to be drawn around multiple sections um, in, the, in the community or within the county. And so in the case of your county, if just hypothetically it was drawn around the city of Casper and around X amount of land along the North, the North Platte corridor, assuming a majority of those businesses supported it and wanted to move that forward, we would see that as a friendly amendment and a good amendment. Second question. Mr. Mr. Chairman, uh, in the draft bill that's in front of us here from, from 19 uh, on page eight, section D, there's a procedure here where to as eventually to stop a district, 50% of the businesses have to object uh, as opposed to the normal procedure. You have to have an election where, where it gets approved. Uh, that troubles me a bit. Could you comment on why that's there and, and done that way as opposed to having to have an affirmative uh, vote of some group to approve it? Mr. Chairman, Senator Scott, thank you for the question. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, every year as written in that language that from the 2019 bill, every year there would be a 30 day window open where if the more than 50% of the participating businesses felt like the business plan wasn't being adhered to, things weren't going the way they wanted for whatever reason, if they objected once a year, there would be that window to dissolve the TID. That is the most common avenue um, that has been utilized across the country as it relates to TID, because the spirit of this is driven by business or relinquished by business, one or the other. If that was something that we needed to work through, certainly we wouldn't want that to be the hang up on the bill moving forward. Okay. Other questions, Representative McGuire? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you mentioned the four different types of participating businesses, and I'm apologize, I can't seem to find where that is in here. Is it in the definitions or where is it? Where are they actually named? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman and Representative McGuire, I went through it twice last night. Let me just quickly go through and find where that is because I'm sure it is in here. Page nine. Yeah, yeah. Right, and so um, on page 19, starting at line 18, an assessment shall only be levied under this chapter on a business that derives 10% or more of its gross revenue from tourism, including lodging, restaurants, attractions, or resort. <clears throat> that was an amendment, Representative McGuire, and I think that that language needs a little tweaking. I think that the bill could be narrowed. That just says, a biz, including those four. From our perspective, I would prefer to narrow it to where just those four were included. And the reason why is because in having discussions about this issue over the last couple of years, the more we cast a broader net, even though personally I like the flexibility, the more we run into heartburn about, are you gonna rope my business into it? I've heard, are you gonna, my energy company, my, my, my you know, all, anything you can think of, there's concern about it. And so again, if this is to benefit and grow the local visitor economy, we feel like it's appropriate um, to be narrowed to that scope to alleviate concerns that we've heard. Okay, follow it up. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So what exactly are the four different categories? Overnight, pardon me, Mr. Chairman, Representative, overnight accommodations, resorts, restaurants, and attractions. Do any other states have a, a temporary? So obviously there's a tourist season in Wyoming for many of our um, you know, cities and some major special events like in my community for Frontier Days. Do tourism improvement districts allow um, for only let's say a month of the year or a week of the year to raise that extra fee um, during mm -hmm. special periods or do you have to do a six month or an annual for those five years? Um, they can't be taken off or put on Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As the bill is written, it would be written for the first term to be no more than five years with the 30 day open window to kill it once a year, as we've spoken about. I'm not sure if that is adjusted. Again, we base this 
off of what has been model language and most successful around the country as these have continued to grow. Uh, and as more states have used them and developed them. Um, that doesn't mean that that doesn't exist. I'm just not aware of it right now, but I can certainly look into that. Other questions for Mr. Brown? Not seeing any other right now. Don't go too far. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Yep. County clerks, anything on tourism improvement districts? Not yet. General support, or just general comments after this on special districts. Okay. Senator Scott. Yeah, I asked the county clerk <clears throat> one question. Come on up, Ms. Langford. Been waiting for two days for this. <laughs> yep, go ahead, Senator Scott. With regard to water and sewer districts, uh, do the county clerks have anything to do with their elections currently? So water and sewer districts, I understand, are special districts. And Mary, if you would oh. officially introduce yourself for the record. Excuse me. Yeah. Mr. Chairman and, and committee, I'm Mary Lankford, and I have the honor of representing Wyoming's county clerks. Um, and your question concerning water and sewer districts, uh, they are formed and they, currently they are formed and they are uh, controlled by the Special District Election Act, which has formation, it has election rules, it has what happens if your district is towards dissolution, uh, if your district isn't functioning, um, there's laws in place to monitor them. Mr. Chairman, do the, do the county clerks have any responsibilities for the elections that those people hold? Depends. Ms. Langford. Um, Mr. Chairman and Senator Scott, depends probably on the county. We have a number of county clerks that administer special district elections regularly. And we have a number of county clerks or counties where those special districts are done by the district themselves. Um, larger, typically larger special districts are done by the county clerk. Uh, there's three dates that that can happen, May, March, and November. Um, so yes and no. Any question with the county clerks on tourism? Seeing none. Thank you, though. Yep. Coming up. Um, Wham, anything in terms of improvement districts? Ms. Simmons, Ms. Kaiser. Ms. County commissioners have anything? All right, Mr. Rudloff, come on down. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Darren Rudloff with Rudloff Solutions. We provide tourism services to lodging tax boards throughout Wyoming and in other states as well. Before that, I was the CEO at Visit Cheyenne, uh, promoting travel and tourism here in Laramie County for the past 22 uh, years. When I go around Wyoming and work, work with many of uh, the lodging tax boards throughout the state, I'm always struck by the fact that while there are many similarities, there are also significant differences. Those lodging tax boards that are working on tourism in your counties uh, they all have representatives from hotels, restaurants, your tourism stakeholders in each county. And the challenges in each county usually are somewhat different. And the strategies to uh, deal with them are somewhat different in each county. Some counties want to aggressively hold more festivals and events to attract people into their areas. Other counties want to have sports tournaments and that requires going out and finding tournament planners to bring them into your communities. Other communities want to do some physical infrastructure, like work on their downtowns, do wayfinding signs, or create more trails or trailheads to create more outdoor recreation. And some counties are fine exactly the way they are. They really don't want to rock the boat uh, either way. They're kind of happy with the way they have it in their tourism world. The tourism improvement district concept works well with all of these situations because it really is community led. It's led by the local community leaders. It's led by the tourism businesses in that county. So if people are totally fine with the way things are, this is enabling legislation. Nothing needs to happen. However, for those communities that want a boost, who wanna be competitive against Billings and Rapid City, a little bit more, they can take this step and those businesses can take this step to help them become more competitive. 
And again, as Chris said, if the businesses do not like the way this is going, they opt out. You know, majority of businesses that are self-imposing this assessment have to approve it before it goes forward and if it continues each year. So all in all, this is a very powerful tool that many destinations are using in other states right now, our competitors, and it could be quite a valuable tool for us here in Wyoming as well. Question, Senator Scott. Mr. Chairman, if we proceed with legislation in this area, would it be wise to allow one of the potential managers or one of the potential groups that organizes one of these to be the lodging tax boards, whatever they're called? Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ridloff. Senator Scott, uh, certainly uh, the existing lodging tax boards could be the tool or the managing mechanism to help manage these funds. But they don't have to be any idea on kind of percentage wise in the country or most yes. housed under a local okay. Yes, most do not have two separate entities. Most have them combined for efficiencies. Yes. Okay. Yep, go ahead. Mr. Mr. Chairman, my thought and what I'm really trying to probe is should we make, make it an option or should, I suppose we could not make it an option say that's gonna be the way we're gonna do it. But I suspect it might work better if you're finding a great difference amongst the, the various boards, depending on local circumstances, to make that an optional way to proceed. Wouldn't you possibly agree? I think so, uh, Mr. Chairman, and I, forgive me, I don't recall exactly the language in this bill on how that is addressed, but uh, I think, again, this is all workable. Okay, further questions? Seeing none, thank you very much, Mr. President Sweeney. You here to talk tourism? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be brief on. I, I just uh, was very supportive when this was brought in 19. I think it just gives an additional tool uh, as does the cultural and uh, the, the district um, uh, as far as development. Uh, that Senator Netter, Nettercott uh, brought forward. Um, so with this particular, I, I think as many tools as we can give to our communities as possible, especially with the, um, with the downturn. And um, I, I just think it goes to the people um, that are going to utilize these, and if we can provide some of these tools, would be great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Questions for Ms. Sweeney? Seeing none. Mr. Chernick, Ms. Kaufman, I know you've been waiting patiently online. Anything you would like to add? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I feel I've spent the day with you guys, and you've had some really hot topics coming out in Natrona County. So I appreciate your time and energy today. Uh, I don't want to be redundant, so I will make my comments quick. Just to follow up on Mr. Brown's testimony, and you here. just officially introduce yourself for us. Oh, I'm so sorry, Brooke Kaufman. I'm the CEO of Visit Casper. I'm also a county commissioner here in Natrona County. So quickly to follow up on the testimony of Mr. Brown and Mr. Rudloff, uh, we've obviously been in front of you several times for the last few years to talk about this type of legislation. I appreciate your support on the statewide lodging tax. So I just wanted to provide some context on how a community might be able to use something like this. So in our area, there's probably three key things that I just think a TID would help expand upon to help drive uh, our visitor economy is actually across the state. Uh, the first piece would be a, there's a misperception that when there's an event held, for example, CNFR, which is coming up next week for us, that CNFR just chooses Casper because they choose Casper, or they just walked into the Ford Wyoming Center one day and said, that's a really great location. I think we're going to do that. When reality is the, the mechanisms that play behind events like that, I mean, it's a, it's a several hundred thousand dollar a year event. A lot of people have to give money. So there's always bid fees involved or infrastructure or closing the gap on funding. So as we continue to recruit business to Casper to help create jobs or drive our business economy, one of the keys to that is being able to have bid fees or to be able to help, for lack of a better or more elegant way to say it, be able to buy that business. So uh, uh, TID funding would actually help expand that. So right now we're just 
we're really up against Billings and Rapid City. They're buying a lot of things that we at times were successful and at times we're not. So that would be the first. Uh, the second would then be, and I don't have a lot necessarily of specifics to add because I want to keep this short, uh, but marketing promotion. So right now, obviously with COVID, our budget was impacted just around $800,000 this year. So having another mechanism in play, whether it's COVID or whether it's just to be able to have a diverse stream of income to be able to continue to do that, I, our job is to create jobs and those funds would absolutely help go a long way in that. And then the last piece of this, and I appreciate the people who 30 plus years ago sat in your chairs and said, we're gonna give local communities the opportunity to promote tourism through the lodging tax. One of the restrictions of the lodging tax, which has, has, has been helpful and a restriction, I guess in the same breath is product development. So our agencies are uh, marketing things that other people are building and we quite often don't have a, a, a piece of the conversation that says, hey, if we were just able to do this, this would drive tourism. So my, my poor example would be if we just put a Ferris wheel in David Street Station, I would increase occupancy 20%. I don't believe that's true, but it gives you a good example. Typically our agencies can't fund anything in a capital way. So TID funding, if allowed by the people who approve that, that district, uh, would also help go towards some product development. So just some just some ideas for how you're also the communities you're from might also use those funds. But with that, Mr. Chairman, I would stand for any questions. Questions for Ms. Kaufman, Commissioner Kaufman, and CEO Kaufman. <clears throat> seeing none. Thank you very much for spending your day with us. Uh, thank brother. you. Always a pleasure seeing you. You too. Right. Any other public comment on tourism improvement districts? Not seeing any online. Not seeing. Any... All right, we'll close public comment. Committee, thoughts, discussion, motions. Representative Duncan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'll make a comment and then I'd like to make a motion um, or revise my previous motion. I, I don't see why we can't perhaps maybe, my idea is to take my previous motion of the community development bill and maybe tweak the title and roll all of these districts into one bill. So instead of having a community district, uh, I mean, a community, uh, community development bill, a tourism district and a um, uh, cultural uh, district bill, um, instead of having all these like three or four different districts, why not have them all into one bill that's generic enough that uh, the different communities and uh, municipalities can pick and choose what fits best for them. Um, entertain a second, but I do think the taxation structure of individual unique businesses contemplated in the current TID bill is, is a very separate concept than what's anticipated currently in the community development districts would be my but if there's a second, we can explore this. But I'm not seeing any Representative Duncan. But the, the, yeah, the mechanism is very different. But if you have other, any other motions? Mr. Chairman? <laughs> Go ahead, Representative Duncan. Can, can we figure out how to simplify this? Because my, my fear is when we get to the floor, if you have three different separate ones, they're going to die. So we need to figure out how, I mean, they're all great ideas, but we need to figure out how to streamline, simplify this so that something can get passed. I, I just wanna give the, the communities a choice, but we have to, we know, we know how distasteful this is to a lot of people on the floor. And so as much as we love it, um, we gotta make it palatable in, for the other um, members to be able to see past, you know, and give them the option. So how do we combine maybe the cultural and the tourism into one so that we can get this through? Senator Boner has thoughts on that. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, you know, obviously a lot of these bills died in the house, so I defer to to my house colleagues as to what the specific hurdles are, but I'm on the fence on all of these. And the only thing that's frankly that I'm that allows me to support any of these are the sideboards. You know, with the previous bill draft is that it's only within the municipal boundaries. With this one, it's only, you know, tourism related businesses that would be assessed. Uh, so I think, I don't know how I'm open to the idea of streamlining it, if that's somehow the hurdle that uh, we're facing, but it seems to me that uh, you're going to, get more support with strong sideboards so that and you know representing a rural area I, 
I'm concerned about how other improvement districts work when you uh, tax the property, but then it's left towards a democratic vote where, and there's a disproportionate, you know, the people who own a lot of property are farmers and ranchers who don't actually have a, a huge voice. And, and so there's a disproportionate effect if we don't do it right and have those sideboards. So I appreciate the sideboards that are in both these bill drafts we have. And I can't think of a good way off the top of my head to streamline. So from my perspective, what's it's worth, I think that it's, uh, you know, if we want to get past, we might have to go separate routes, but I'm open to a different way, but we have to have a specific idea as to how to do that. Senator Driscoll, and then Senator Chairman, Scott. I'd suggest we go ahead and run the bill drafts if we can, because I'd talked about joining them, and I realized we were going through the PID, because it's a very much different than what Senator Boner talked about. It doesn't affect ag. It's just the businesses that are there. That's the only thing it hits. And for a correction point, it died in the Senate. They actually got it out of the House. We, we cut its throat. <laughs> well, we can say we pulled our members, and they don't support this. Grant <laughs> Uh, and the community the development here? district bill did die in the house by two votes um based on kind of being attacked by both sides that the people who were very anti-tax and then um the minority party came out fairly strong against it thinking it would create inequity um in certain communities and municipalities and and divide them into rich areas and poor areas that you could draw a district that would be beneficial to one part of town at the expense of the rest of the town so that was that was the argument of community development districts by two votes yeah. a couple of years back. Mr. Chairman, um, if I may, yeah, it was an interesting situation that resulted from my understanding in the House was that it was um, that unique alliance that occurs over there um, between uh, the two. And so the primary um, motivating factor was the issue concerning gentrification. And in fact, even today, I've heard from some stakeholders um, that that's a concern heard within some of our, our other municipalities within the state that there will be uh, disparate um, housing developments and, and disparate economic um, barriers within our communities. I guess I look forward to, to dealing with that challenge rather than <laughs> rather than no, nothing. Um, but uh, yeah, that's an accurate um, understanding of, of why the bill failed in the house and certainly um, an interesting um, and challenging time. I would support uh, the separate bill drafts like, like Chairman Driscoll has indicated. I do think that the concepts associated with them are different enough uh, that they would be appropriate to be separated out. And if we wanna combine them, we can certainly do that at the next meeting, but to, to separate them out. As far as including culture or arts and tourism, you know, I, I hesitate to do that. I'm a little, frustrated uh, by the culture and arts stakeholders that didn't come forward with any consensus as to what they wanted or how they wanted that structured. And I think what we heard from the stakeholders for tourism is they know exactly what they're looking for. And uh, like, you know, the, the larger communities in the state certainly support the, the community development district bill. So, uh, and they were here to testify, but I think left as a result of time. So there's two tangible solutions from two stakeholders. So I don't wanna do the work of the art community for them. They need to make a decision about what it is that they want and come forward with that solution. Senator Scott, do you still have questions, discussion? I, I too would support the, the separate bill drafts that uh, Co-Chairman Driscoll was, was calling for. Uh, I would suggest with the tourism districts that we ask them to be drafted with Two changes. One be. Do you want to make a motion to have the bill draft and just incorporate that? Okay. Thanks. I'll make, I'll make it. And my my two requests would be one to on uh, the provision that's found uh, on page eight, lines eight through nineteen, that we turn that around into it takes a positive approval of the uh, majority of the businesses rather than a majority of the businesses. They don't object, those into effect. Uh, I think that'll make it uh, a better, more standard bill and easier to pass. And second, uh, there was a comment on uh, page 19, the bottom there lines, in subsection C, lines 18 through 21, uh, that, that needs to be reworked to be more specific 
And I would ask that that be done so that limited to those four, unless there's an explicit group that's added in uh, to accommodate a special circumstance. What I'm really thinking of is an ability to reach out to the, the fishing guides and whatnot in our community. Okay, that's the motion. Is there a second? Seconded by McGuire. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Hewitt. Just on the, the first piece, uh, there is a opt-in requirement uh, for the development of the petition that starts the process. Uh, so that, that majority of businesses uh, needs to sign the petition to get the, the process going. So there is an opt-in at the beginning, but once that's set, then it becomes an opt-out over the years. Okay, maybe that takes care of it. Maybe. Further discussion on the motion? Senator Case. Well, Mr. Okay. Chairman, I- I know you love this bill, you always have. Oh, I don't like this bill, but I, and I also have a, I have a conflict on this bill, but I'm not going to, you know, until we actually have a bill that we're working on, I'm not going to declare that conflict, but no, I don't like this bill. Um, and I just see lots of trouble with this bill, frankly. Uh, I don't like this socialism aspect, if you want my opinion, but for example, uh, you know, a big business, a little business, they have the same vote in this. And those are things I guess will work out, but uh, you could have a large hotel with 200 rooms. They get one vote, I assume, and a tourist shop that sells uh, broken teapots on occasion and uh, they get one vote. I, I just think it's kind of unworkable. Plus it's just basically unfair, but I'll save the conflict for later. We'll have plenty of time, I think. I'm glad you saved conflict. You don't see it as a competition bill between us and Billings and Rapid City as much than I take it. Other discussion <laughs> on the uh, motion before us? Seeing none, all in favor of a bill draft for our next meeting to review tourism improvement districts, please say aye. 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 That was enthusiastic. Opposed say <laughs> no. 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 <laughs> I think the motion carries. As enthusiastic as it was. Are there further motions or discussions on special districts, Clerk Langford or former Clerk Langford, uh, special districts in general? Come on down. Mr. Chairman and committee members, um, again, I'm Mary Langford. I represent the County Clerks Association of Wyoming. Uh, my comments are going to be brief and probably pretty anticlimactic after everything you've seen today. We would, the county clerks are involved with the Special District Election Act in that we certify the, the names that come on petitions to form these districts. Uh, we conduct the formation elections. A lot of counties conduct the continuing elections. And we also are involved in filing their uh, public records. We also get the notices when they don't file their financial reports with the Department of Audit and get notified that they need to be dissolved. And so the county clerks are pretty involved in the, the activities of these districts. Uh, we encourage you and hope that you will continue to use the uh, Special District Election Act that had all of the hard work that Senator Case mentioned a few years ago in it. Uh, there are a lot of really good uh, direction for county clerks to be able to do their job, uh, to take care of the districts. We just encourage you to look at that when you get some district that comes in and has a creative idea on how they should form or how they should pursue. Uh, you have good law in place that you, could, you can monitor those districts and uh, if, the, if they'll be enforced. <laughs> so. That's, that's our only statement after all of that and, and from what all of you have heard, but uh, there has been a lot of hard work done on those. Uh, there are, as there, you said, there are 700 special districts in the county or in the state and every county has got a number of those districts that they help those districts do their own business or they, you know, they do a lot of their business for them through the county and, and especially the county clerks have the direct uh, contact with them, so. Um, please just be mindful of chapter 29 in the election code. Okay. Any questions to Kenny Clerk on special districts while I have them? Seeing none. Thank you for saying. Any other comments on special districts from WAM or County Commissioners Association? Yeah, Kaiser. 
All right. Anything else, committee, on special districts you want to pursue this 2021 season? I'm not seeing any motions or any hands. So we'll move on to our next topic. Do I really want you to make a motion? Yes, I do, if you feel so inclined. Please. Okay, Mr. Chairman. Reverend Duncan, go ahead. Thank you. I move that we have a draft of cultural districts. Would you like to expand the current museum districts to include cultural districts or creative arts districts or create a whole new mm -hmm. category of a special district for creative? All of the above. Pretty sure that was an either or question. Um, <laughs> but if you get a second, we will clarify the motion. Second. But I'm not seeing a second, so I appreciate second. you trying again. All right, I'll do a second. I got a second from Rutherford Clifford online. So the motion to clarify would be to take the existing museum district, special district, and expand that to be a creative arts district, which would include museums, but would also include anything um, that a, that special district would like under the creative arts that may be more expansive than a museum. Okay, that's the motion. Senator Scott. Chairman, on the motion, uh, I'm gonna vote no, and I'm gonna explain why. Uh, frankly, I think there may well be something there, but I don't think there's the necessary consensus within the various creative arts and, and their, their various organizations and individuals to sustain such a bill just yet. I think, think that they need to do some more work in terms of what they really want and what they think would work uh, and try to develop a consensus within before it's, it's time for us to get involved. Okay, further discussion? Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 All opposed say no. 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 Motion has failed. All right, anything else in special districts? They're so special. Seeing none, let us move on to yesterday's agenda on election topics. I know we had some people stay today. Um, so there was um, at least one other specific topic on management councils a list of interims which included appointments uh, and a, a bill that was introduced in the 2021 session on changing the appointment process for congressional and statewide legislative leaders. Mr. Hopkinson apparently is going to testify from the main dais, if you'd like. There's only one person here. Welcome. Mr. Chairman, should we hear that? Mr. Chairman, should we hear that today with most of the people being gone that might testify. I think because we have some people who've stayed for public comment and to listen, we're gonna, I'm gonna ask Mr. Hopson to do a two or three minute brief summation of the issue. I think uh, not might... going to too much depth and then people who wanna testify, then we can decide as a committee if we wanna move the issue to our next meeting, hear more next meeting, et cetera. Um, I think they want it to but I'm optimistic anyway. that it won't be more than five, 10 minutes total. So with that, uh, maybe a two or three minute overview of the legislation and what the question before the legislature is. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. David Hopkinson with the Legislative Service Office. <clears throat> um, just to provide, uh, looking at uh, 2021 House Bill 222, vacancies in elected office, and just to give a brief overview of that uh, bill for the committee's consideration and discussion. Essentially what this bill would do is take the existing structure for special elections that are in place for representatives to Congress, and it would apply those to the US Senator, the governor, state legislatures, and the other state elected officials. So in a nutshell, that's what this draft does. Um, and we see those changes being made on page two of the bill to the governor's office providing for that special election. On page three, just primarily some conforming amendments. Um, we get into the bulk of what the bill is doing really on page five and six is where we see the major changes. Uh, and section 105 is where we see kind of some of the distinctions that are made in the bill, wherein that if a general election is within six months uh, for senators and representatives to Congress, within three months of the general election for 
state legislatures, secretary of state, state auditor, state treasurer, or superintendent of public instruction, or within 60 days um, for the office of governor, uh, then they would simply be elected at the general election. If we're outside of those timeframes, um, <clears throat> then it would be sent to a special election and that special election would need to occur within the first Tuesday following the 89th day of the vacancy for the, the United States Senator or Representative of Congress, within 39th day for state legislature and other state uh, elected officials, and within the 29th day um, for the office of governor. Um, the rest of what's in the bill is primarily uh, cleanup or um, conforming amendments. Um, on page nine, it, section one at 108 is, is just specifying there uh, towards the bottom of page nine that um, that a candidate for an unexpi unexpired term of a vacated office uh, can only seek election under the party that they were registered as at the time of the vacancy. So they aren't allowed to switch parties for that. Um, But otherwise, I think that is kind of the core of the bill and what's provided here. Some of the repealers we see are just uh, no longer applicable based on the bill. And I would stand for any questions on that. Questions from Coppinson? All right, seeing none, thanks. Oh yeah, Senator Boner. So do you have any idea why we treat our Congress person separately? And okay, and I understand there used to be, you know, back in, you know, before 1914, we used to like representatives differently than we do our U.S. senators, but I'm just wondering why everything is so different for our congressperson. And I guess I, I have issues or concerns, I guess, Mr. Chairman, with the way that we run that appointment now. And I question whether that still makes sense, but uh, either you could answer that. Apparently we have a, some good historic background to my left too. So. Senator Scott would really like to answer this question. Go ahead. Mr. Chair, Mr. Chairman, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the congressional one is done because the feds have the constitutional power to tell us how to do it, and they have done that. So it conforms to the, the federal requirements. Uh, for, the, for the rest of them, that's up, up to us. Uh, as I understand, I think our current system has worked just fine. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Okay. Generally agree, Mr. Hopkinson. Blame the feds. That sounds good to me. Right. Mr. Well, <laughs> okay, other questions from Mr. Hopkinson? Seeing none, thanks. Uh, general public comment on the topic. County clerks have anything? Okay, Ms. Simmons. Mr. Is it Sicknick? Representative Sweeney, no? I wasn't even looking at you, but uh, just in case you want to testify, no? But I'm assuming you do, and I made you wait for two days. So, welcome, Brian. Um, I'm an attorney here in Cheyenne, I've been practicing about 27 years now. Um, I wasn't here yesterday, actually I was on the road at Foster Freeze's funeral, and uh, so I wasn't able to be here yesterday, but I did understand that you uh, were going to be ad addressing this bill again today, so I thought I better come over. Um, uh, I also serve as general counsel for the Wyoming Republican Party, um, and um, I was with Chairman E. Thorne and National Committee Man Corey Steinmetz um, last couple of days when we first learned that this bill was going to be considered by this committee today and yesterday. And so, um, can I stop you real fast? Sure. You said you just learned this was going to be considered. In the last two days? We just learned that in the last couple of days. That's right. Okay. I mean, we had, go ahead. Well, and so that is, that is one of the primary things that um, they were concerned about that they felt that we should uh, bring to the attention of the body is that uh, we didn't see this coming. Um, one of the co-sponsors of the bill is the uh, liaison from the legislature to the Wyoming Republican Party. And uh, we haven't heard anything from, um, from him. Um, so that was a bit of a surprise. Um, and I guess uh, some of the, at this point, we have more questions than anything. 
Um, one of those questions would be, where's the fire here? Um, why is this a hot burning topic? Why now? Um, some of the other questions would be, um, who are the constituents that are calling for this? Um, as I walked around the building before I came in, I didn't see anyone with pitchforks or torches. Um, I haven't seen any op-eds in the paper. Um, haven't seen anyone calling for this change. Um, so it would be helpful to know who exactly um, feels that this is a good idea. Um, and so uh, we simply just wanted to raise those issues to your, con um, to your attention uh, so that some of those issues could be addressed. Um, I don't believe there is an issue here. Um, I've seen Senator Brass so many times over the last couple of years. He's the last one who was appointed um, under this process. And I haven't heard him complain about how the process worked, nor have I heard any of the people of the state of Wyoming complaining about how that process worked. I think they're pretty happy with it. So, um, so that's all I have for you, Mr. Chairman. I'd sit for any questions that you might have. Sure, questions, Mr. Shuck? So I, I just wanna make sure that right now the state Republican party doesn't take a position, but does have some concerns about maybe the mechanisms and the need for the bill. Is that a fair assessment of your testimony? At, at this point, that's right. Okay. Senator Scott. Uh, question. Uh, when Mark Gordon was appointed state treasurer after the, uh, was, was that subsequent or before Brass was appointed to the Senate? I don't remember. I think it was after. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, so there's another case where the current system worked perfectly. Or Secretary of State Buchanan. Yeah, that's right. There's been a couple more. Uh, Representative Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Brian, just out of curiosity, Who's the li liaison? I guess I'm in the dark here. Who's the liaison you were talking about? Uh, Senator Wasserberger. Wasserberger, thank you. Other questions for Mr. Shuck? Seeing Senator Wasserberger, are you the liaison? I think the, the confusion I, I from the committee up here, Mr. Shuck, comes from that. Um, it's, well, it's been on our public agenda for a couple of weeks, but it was in our management council uh, meeting. I don't remember when management council was. A couple months ago. Um, a couple months ago, but it was discussed and put on our interim topics. So, um, and it, we did, it was a house bill committee that was not considered in the house uh, this last session, but it was an election issue relating to appointments. I believe it was put into the mix of election issues for the committee to consider this summer is my understanding of where it came from. Um, Mr. Chairman. I did have a similar bill that did different things. And I think this was Representative Harshman's bill that I brought three or four years ago um, that he took and ran with a different direction. But that's my understanding of where the bill draft came from. Senator Boner. So Mr. Chairman, in all seriousness, I'm assuming that since Senator Wasberger is chairman of the GOP Republican caucus in the Senate that and he does coordinate with the party for the purposes of having a caucus before we uh, you know, come into session. But I, I, if that is what we're referring to, I, I wanna make sure that it's not my understanding as vice chairman of that caucus, that it's an exclusive, it's exhaustive uh, liaison on all matters uh, with the Wyoming Republican Party. I think we worked together for that organizational caucus just before a session, but that's uh, about the extent of it. So I hope that there's not a miscommunication there. And if so, I, I, can, I can talk to you as, as a, the other person, other senator involved on our side in the Senate, and make sure that we have a, a clear communication expectations there. Great, that would be great. Thank you know, I don't remember Senator Wasserberger being at Management Council, so he, just as a co-sponsor of a piece of legislation, he may not even know it got assigned to this committee as well. Um, so, I, yeah, don't go back and uh, say, Senator Wasserberger, what were you doing? I don't, he may truly not. Um, I'm already just did you? And said, what were you doing? <laughs> um, anyway, other questions uh, from Mr. Shuck from the committee? Seeing no further questions, thank you very much for coming thank over. Thank you. And I forgot, like, some other uh, local uh, Republicans were in the audience all day yesterday waiting for the bill we didn't get to, and I didn't mean to confuse you. you I just meant yesterday. there was a uh, preference. Uh, Mr. Hornock did on, yes. yes, we did have some other testimony yesterday. 
Um, Ms. Simmons, come on down. Gail Simmons, uh, Sheridan County, uh, speaking uh, basically on Civics 307, again, just my um, opinion, I, I, I would always be on this, the side of voter participation in any elected um, official. And uh, so while I don't know of any problems with the, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, with the identified uh, top five and uh, Senator Barrasso's assignment, uh, th the fact is that the voter participation um, for precinct positions, uh, uh, partisan precinct positions is south of, or, or just about 50% in terms of uh, the number of votes cast in, in 2020. At the same time, uh, the voter participation uh, in, in um, the legislative positions is upwards of 90%. And for our top five, uh, the lowest it's been in the last several elections for our top five has been 79% and 81%. And those were single choice. Uh, otherwise for Senator, US Senator, US House and the top five, uh, they are some of the highest participation of, of our voters. So while there may not be anything broke, I would always go on the side of having the voters decide who represents them uh, regardless of, of party. And I stand for any questions. Questions from Ms. Simmons? Seeing none, committee. Hey, thank you very much. Thanks. Any further testimony? Mm -hmm. Can and clerks don't have a position on financing if we took out. The bill does call for an election type process. I, move the I just wanted to make sure, Miss. I just can't believe you don't have any testimony at all, Ms. Langford, on maybe you can tell us what the cost would potentially be if you've reviewed the legislation. Mr. Uh, Chairman and committee, uh, it would be a special election and the best number that we probably can pull out of the air at this point with that is our $1.1 million uh, that we talked about with the runoff election, what that election would cost. There's a basic cost of pulling up for elections. And I would imagine that in this particular case, uh, you wouldn't want to try to uh, consolidate or, or do a mail ballot or something crazy like that. You would conduct that election like you would any other election for a, a uh, to fill a vacancy. Um, so yeah, the cost and where would the money come from, I guess is the, is the comment that the clerks would have for that, but. Um, All right, so thanks for letting me call you up. No questions to the county clerks, President mm -hmm. McGuire. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I have a question for you. Langford, so. uh, technically, what is a precinct committee person because it's not technically a contested election. What do you, what's the term of art? Mr. Chairman and uh, representatives, so a precinct committee person, uh, they are elected at the primary election. They file for office. They represent their precinct uh, for their party. So, you know, the Republicans have their precinct people, the Democrats have their precinct people. Uh, their concern is the issues that are within their precinct uh, to be able to represent in the party. Uh, and it's quite a large piece of the ballot at the, pre or at the primary election uh, that the precinct people are involved in. And uh, typically, uh, depending on how active the party is in your county, a lot of times there may not be anybody that's filed for those. So they're resolved either by a, a write-in or possibly an appointment. Um, because there hasn't been an election. Um, okay. Further questions? None. Thanks. All okay. right. Any other testimony on the issue? Seeing none. Post public. All right. The motion table is not debatable. So all in favor of tabling it to the next meeting, say aye. Aye. Okay. Post say no. 
All right, now we are at that point of business, finally, of general public comment. Any issues the public has on anything the corporations, elections, and political subcommittee can take on, explore, help answer? Looking at you guys, county clerks, nothing? Simmons, good? You get a second on your motion. All right, I'm not seeing anyone online. So with that committee, we only have one last order of business before the motion to adjourn. Um, as I think most of the committee does know, this will be the last official meeting and second to last day of um, our good LSO attorney, Mr. Hewitt, who has been with corporations for quite a while and um, will be moving on. And so we have um, given him a lovely parting gift. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. It's a been a privilege to serve this committee and the Wyoming legislature and with uh, the great LSO staff. So thank you very much for the, for the wonderful five plus years. And with that committee, our next meeting of corporations will actually be a redistricting meeting um, we will check schedules. I assume it'll be around the time of the Salt Lake City meeting, which we are uh, currently checking with LSO because it's out of state travel. If there's any official request we need to do, as you all know, we do have a redistricting budget. Um, so we don't necessarily need to um, ask for more financing for anything. We just need to make sure we can have out of state travel, but expect a redistricting one day meeting um, sometime in July. And then our next corporation's official meeting will be at the end of August, likely in Casper if they'll have us this time. So I will send out the dates and make sure everyone's on the same page of our next upcoming meetings for both redistricting and corporations. Hope you all have a safe drive home. We can be adjourned. <laughs>